All right, so in a previous video, we developed this converter, and we called this the step-down converter, and we proved that this was uh, the sort of practical implementation of the step-down converter, sometimes referred to as the buck converter. But we also said that this was a part of a class of converters called the direct converter. And in this case, we said that the power flows from left to right, and V1 is greater than V2, therefore the voltage is being stepped down. So we have to implement this type of switch network. But we can do the exact same thing, or we can follow the exact same process as we did in the previous video. And if you haven't seen that, I'll link that in the description below so you can take a look at that. Otherwise, you'll be fairly confused when we d deal with all this kind of stuff. But we can also reverse the direction of power flow. And if we want to reverse the direction of power flow, uh, what that means is that you'll go from a lower voltage to a higher voltage, because in this case, we said that uh, V1 is greater than V2, right? And so if V1 is greater than V2, that means, and the power is flowing from left to right, in this case, that means it's a step down. But if we want to go step up, then we want to go in the opposite direction, right? So we want to get rid of this, and we want to say that the power should go this way. Now, if the voltages are fixed, the way you go in the opposite direction, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can reverse the power flow. And the way to reverse the power flow is you either reverse the terminal currents or the voltages. And so, generally speaking, it's usually easier to think about reversing currents than it is to think about reversing voltages. So we're going to imagine that we're reversing the terminal currents, okay? So now, instead of I1 going towards the right, we're going to say that I1 actually is going to go towards the left, and I2, which was originally going towards the right, although we've drawn it as going towards the left, will actually go towards the left now, right? Because last time we established that I2 is actually a negative value because it's actually going towards the right. So we're assuming that the power flows towards the left, and I1 is going towards the left, and I2 is going towards the left. But it's not enough for us to just assume that the terminal currents are reversed. If we're going to reverse the terminal currents, we also have to reverse the switch currents. And what that means then is that the current in this switch, so remember, we said that initially this current was going that way, which is why we chose the transistor. But now, and we said that if it was a positive voltage and a positive current, then we pick a transistor. And we said that if it was a positive voltage and a negative current, or if they were in opposite directions, I shouldn't say positive or negative, if the current and the... Uh, voltage had the same polarity, then we said we could use a switch. If the current and the voltage had an opposite polarity, then we would use a diode, or a transistor and diode, not switch. Um, so if this is positive and this is positive, then we use a transistor. But now we're saying, okay, hold on a second, we're going to actually go this way, meaning we can't use a transistor here anymore, right? Because the voltage here is positive, but this is now going in the opposite direction. Right? Uh, essentially, I shouldn't say positive and negative. I should say the same or, or opposite polarity. So if we are going to have opposite polarity voltage and current, then we have to actually use a diode here. And because it's going to be flowing from the left to the right, we're going to put the diode in like this. So now you can have the current and the voltage in the opposite direction. Okay? Then, what we want to do is the same thing, or same reasoning, sort of, we're going to apply here. So I'll erase this for a second just so it's clearer. So in this case, we had initially that the current was going up, and the voltage was like this, right? So now we have that the current will have to be going in the same direction, and we have to go going down. So we have to reverse the current, right? So it's not even about same or different, it's about, we have to reverse the if we reverse the terminal conditions, we have to reverse the switch conditions as well, otherwise... None of it makes sense. So what we're going to do here then is we're going to create a switch here, or a transistor, not a switch, a transistor here. Okay, and so now we have power can flow towards the left, whereas in the other case it was flowing towards the right. And if we assume that V1 is greater than V2, then we now go from a lower voltage, which is V2, towards a higher voltage, which is V1, and we call this thing the boost converter. Now this may not be the way that you're used to seeing the boost converter, 
because the way that the boost converter is usually drawn is, I mean, we like to imagine things going from left to right, at least in, in North America. And most of, I guess, Europe, in some places they go from right to left, but you know, in, in most cases we go from left to right. So the better way to sort of imagine this is to redraw this circuit. So let's redraw the circuit with the higher voltage network on the left side. So what I'll do is, I'll do exactly that. So you have your inductor here and you'll have a switch here like, or a transistor here like that. And this is now going to be your high side, or your high voltage network. And the, the diode here will connect here to the capacitor and that will go to your, sorry, this is the lower voltage going to the higher voltage. My mistake. So, and I'll keep these consistent. So I'll say this is V2 and I'll say this is V1, just so you can draw the parallel between what we've just done and, and it'll be easier for you to understand that way. So this is L and you can label currents and stuff here as well if we want. So we'll call this I2 and we'll call this uh, I1 like so, and we will say then that the power flows this way. And in this case, we say that V1 is greater than V2 still. So if you look at the comparison between these two, they're the exact same circuit, I've just flipped them. And so this is the one that, this is the version of the boost converter that you'll see in most literature. This one here is a sort of transition step to get from, um, well, we're reasoning that all of these are the, the same, like we're arguing that the, the direct converter is the same whether it's buck or boost, depending on the direction of power flow. So this is what we have here. So in in the other case, uh, in this case here, we said that the duty ratio is taken as the series switch, right? That's more of a conceptual way of reasoning. In a practical converter, what they say is that the duty ratio or the duty cycle is taken as the a uh, fraction of the period that the controllable switch is on. Because we don't control the diode directly. The diode is controlled as a sort of byproduct of how the transistor is switched, right? So we can control how we switch the transistor on and off, right? So whether this, the, the transistor is in series or it's in shunt, we're going to define, we're going to, I guess, redefine the duty cycle or the duty ratio as being the fraction of the period that the uh, controllable switches on. So the controllable switch in this case is the transistor that I've labeled here as Q. Okay, and so if Q is conducting for uh, dt seconds, so we can we can also derive here a uh, conversion ratio for this case. And in this case, as opposed to doing it with all the waveforms and such, um, well, we can, I guess we can also do it with the waveforms, but we can also, there's another way we can analyze these circuits, and that's kind of breaking them up into their different switching states. So let's say from 0 to dt, so from 0 to dt, right, we say that the switch is conducting, or, or sorry, the transistor is conducting. I should stop saying switch. So this is the, this is the circuit that you're kind of left with. So you have this, the transistor is conducting, we're assuming it's an ideal transistor, this is happening here, and if this is conducting, remember this diode has to be off, and so you're kind of left with, well, not kind of, well, you are left with a circuit that looks like this. And what we're doing in this case, again, is we're, we're writing the equation for VL, right? Because we can use that volt second balance that we um, established uh, in, in order to develop an expression for this, right? So in a case like this, we see that uh, VL is very clearly equal to V2, right? Right, so there's two switching states. Uh, this is one of the switching states. And then the other switching state, which you have is, you have that the transistor will be off, right? So you have the inductor. This is now an open circuit. And there is now a diode here, and this is an ideal diode. So I'm going to replace it with a short circuit. And then again, capacitor, and then V1 here. So we can call this V1. We can call this V2, and again, VL is what we're concerned with, right? So VL, in this case, is equal to V2 minus V1, right? Very simple. And so this is going to happen for, uh, for I can say, from uh, DT to T, which is actually a total of 1 minus D times T, right? which is that like that's the interval if you were to think about it as a sort of duration that's what it is but in terms of times it's dt to t 
And so what you can do is now you can write an expression directly. I mean, you don't need to necessarily draw waveforms, although it is highly encouraged that you always draw waveforms when analyzing circuits like this. Um, this is just a different sort of uh, approach, I guess, you can take. So in a case like this, and again, because see now here, I don't have the luxury of seeing what the waveforms look like. So I have to, I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you how to do it using integration. Um, whereas if you had the waveforms, you could say, look, this is a square here, that's another square there, multiply, get the areas, add them, we're done. So in a case like this, we have to actually go through with the analysis of the integrals, but it's not difficult because, um, again, we know what the nature of the circuit is, but it's a good technique to develop. Uh, you should be comfortable doing both, I would recommend, because in some cases, you can't draw very clear waveforms and you have to resort to this type of technique. But in the cases where you can draw clear waveforms, it's very easy to um, to develop the average uh, or the, the expression for the average voltage and such. So we have, this is the average inductor uh, voltage, and we know that this is equal to zero by the volt-second balance. And if I solve these integrals and I simplify them again, it's a very simple integral to solve. We'll see that we have V2 uh, times dt plus V2 minus one, or V1, uh, times one minus D times T. And if we solve this, we'll get that V2 over V1 is equal to V2 over V1 uh, is equal to one minus D. Okay? Okay. And what that means is that the relationship between the, because uh, again, we said here that we said that V1 is greater than V2, right? So if V1 is greater than V2, then the step that you get from V2 to V1 is going to be one minus D. So that's the ratio sort of. So if let's say for example, let's say for example, I mean, if we just look at this here, so we say, let's pick some like random numbers. I don't know, V1 greater than V2 is the condition that we want, right? So if V1 is uh, 10 and V2, is one, right? Then we know that V2 over V1 has to be equal to one minus D. And then based on that, we can develop what our duty ratio should be for that. So we have V2, uh, well, we said that this is V2. So V2 equals here, and then V1 equals here, right? So V2 over V1 is one over uh, 10. So one over 10, so let's say one over 10 is equal to one minus D. Right? So then that means D should be 90% or 0 0.9, however you want to take that. So you can use this expression to calculate whatever is required. And um, and in a case like this, again, the, the, the main purpose here to, to, to draw it this way and to show it this way is to show you that uh, these two are really, really part of the same thing. They're just, you've kind of flipped things around a little bit here and there. So to get from V2 to V1, you have a uh, you have this type of conversion ratio. So, what's next? Uh, in the next part, what we want to do is we want to look at the current conversion ratio, and the current conversion ratio again is just I two over I one uh, over I one, and we know that this is going to be the inverse, uh, well, negative inverse of the voltage ratio, and so we know that this is what we kind of end up with. This is a sort of simple step that we do. Uh, and so here we can probably put a box here because this is the voltage conversion ratio. So what did we do? We took this established, uh, well, this isn't what we established, but we took an established buck converter and we flipped the, the, the direction of power by flipping the direction of the current. And we said that if we're gonna flip the direction of the current, you have to flip the direction of the switches as well. So that's what we did here. Then we flipped the whole converter back the other way because we're Apparently we're just flipping everything these days. Um, and so we've flipped that from now to go from V2 to V1 uh, because again, we like to think of things going from left to right. And so to accommodate that, we've done that here. So again, V1 is greater than V2. So V2 is the switch that we have, or sorry, V2 is the voltage that we have here. And switching this transistor according to this relationship that we established here will give us, um, will give us a, a behavior in the circuit that will result in a, in a V1 that is larger than V2. Again, we looked at a sort of different way of analyzing the circuit in this case. Uh, in, in the previous case, we've drawn waveforms, 
but in some cases we'll realize that waveforms are not sufficient. Um, well, waveforms are too complicated, so it's not enough to just have waveforms because the waveforms don't give you anything meaningful, so you have to analytically uh, be able to calculate this type of an integral as well. In this case, I mean, the difference is negligible between whether you draw waveforms or you do it this way because the, the functions themselves are very simple. But in general, uh, it's good to have this type of technique as well. And I guess even better would be to use both. So take this, uh, approach the circuit this way, draw the waveform for the complete cycle, and then use this based on the waveforms that you have. So that would be like the full um, 360 approach, I guess you can say, where you're doing it all. And then we develop these expressions uh, here, which are relatively simple. And... Uh, and, and so, yeah, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe to support the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.